somebody right now who might be listening, who might want to get into the field. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely started out learning it myself because I was naturally good at it and I actually liked it. And those are two very important things. I think for anyone to do any job, you need to be good at something and you need to, or at at the very least you need to like what you're doing. Otherwise you're just going to be unhappy in what you do. Um, The, The other piece was, you know, I did end up going to college. I did learn quite a bit getting my bachelor's in that I'm now on the board at my college, supporting them and and everything. So, you know, the programs that are coming out right now and the associates, the bachelor's uh, programs around cyber are amazing and and even network technology. I mean, cybersecurity itself is is really, to me, it's a bit of a myth. Uh, It's not a, it's, cybersecurity is really just good engineering and architecture, period. If you did those things well, Cyber wouldn't really be a need. Um, Interesting. We get a lot of heat for that, but um, my view is if you do those t- first two things well, everything else kind of comes along. With you. So getting a solid understanding in, in in those things, and if that's through school or through a work, you know, hey, go after that. All right, everybody, welcome back to digging in. I'm Matt Rosenthal, and this is the weekly show where we talk about business, life, health, and the coolest part is I do this with some very cool people that have had a wide variety of experiences. They've got a lot of lessons to share. We're gonna dig into those lessons. We're gonna find out about the successes and the failures and the mistakes. I do this for one reason. I do it to to help you. I do it to inspire you and I do it to, okay, I've years and they've done that for me. And for me, if I can pass that, if I can pay that, I feel like I'm helping you out. And so today, with that being said, we're going to hear some powerful stories from a really cool guy. His name is Brian Hoagley. Uh, He's a friend. We do some really cool work together. He's a founder and managing partner of a company called Side Channel, which is a niche cybersecurity firm. He's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about how he got into that. He's got a really cool journey. I don't want to skip over something that I find really cool about him. He's led cyber programs for the DOD, the Pentagon, the intelligence community, Fortune 500, the places he's worked, very cool, been involved with some very cool initiatives. He's a problem solver. He is a renowned speaker and expert on guidance. He's going to talk about that, threat intelligence and strategic initiatives. Man, a lot of stuff. He's done a lot of stuff, Brian. (laughs) Um, So welcome to the show. How are you? Good. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for having me, Matt. It's, uh, It's great to be on. Awesome. I left out one thing. You do have your own podcast. Yes, I do. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's not really a podcast so much as like I. Uh, well, I'll tell you about it. But like it's it's called C- hashtag CISO Life, and it's a video. Um, it's like a video program that I just I, I run. I just talk about, and um, anyone who's ever worked for me has always made fun of me because I don't go anywhere without uh, without a marker or like a white. Like I'm always very close to a whiteboard. Um, but it doesn't work out very well when you're on screen to constantly have your back to the audience. So right. I found out about the whole lightboard technology, which is this um, clear screen where you can face the camera and the audience, draw and write and teach. But the software flips it so that the audience can read it and I don't have to learn how to write backwards. Um, and it's been it's been a really fun technology to play with and then a way to like really kind of get some some basic ideas across to, uh, uh, to, to anyone who wants to learn about information security, risk management and all that. So the, the show is just a fun outlet for me to, you know, I, you know, part of that journey you know, when I was younger was, yeah, it was, was, uh, I wanted to be a history teacher kind of coming out of high school. I really wanted to, to teach. Um, but, uh, something kind of changed in my life and I decided to go into, to take my hobby and my passion, which was computers and working with technology and making that my profession. So I never got to actually be a teacher. Um, and this is kind of my outlet, my way to still um, kind of appease that that niche. So, you know what, that's actually a great segue. And by the way, we did we did do a, a webinar together. When I watched you do that, it was it was the coolest thing. So you got to tell <laughs> me afterwards, like where I go get that thing, because it's very cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, happily, but, yeah, the okay. guys. You're, you're a cybersecurity really expert. And, you know, I know that you just mentioned you had a certain path, but, you know, you started in the military, didn't you? Um, I actually, I started when I was a kid. Um, 
when I was, I've told the story to others, you know, other folks and it's online um, too, but yeah, I started when I was a kid um, learning how to program, learning how to um, just kind of work with computers. Think mid eighties, you know, I'm, I was born in 1980. So I had a very analog childhood um, and, you know, the first computers really kind of becoming commercially available to families. Um, you know, I got my hands on one because of my uncle who was, who was, you know, a very, very smart man gave my dad, you know, the story in my family is he, he gave my dad a computer, an IBM clone. It was like a 386. And, you know, my, my dad's reaction was like the thing that we have at the office, like, the, like the thing, because back then there was only one, yeah, right? Not thing. everyone like had one. So, uh, you know, he got, he gave me one, the dude, my uncle was a brilliant man. He worked on the SR-71 spy plane. He worked on a lot of computer systems through a, a lot of different groups and, and, and initiatives. Um, and one of the things that he ended up doing was he programmed New York State's off-track betting system. And when he retired, they, they, and they had to hire like five people to replace him uh, just to, to keep OTB going. Uh, so very, very smart man. And he gave me my first computer and I started working on that. And it probably wasn't too, too far along before I figured out how to make computers using modems to dial up into other computers and then start figuring out how to make them do things that I needed them to do or getting into, uh, as I kind of say, you know, I went professional in cybersecurity when I was 18, but I had an amateur career before that, that, uh, you know, didn't net me any trouble, but, um, you know, I learned a lot, we'll say during that time, but yeah, it was interesting. Um, I didn't go to college right after high school. I, I ended up going to work and, and, um, you know, in the field and kind of getting some chops. And then when I decided to go to college, I had kind of spent all my money because I was a foolish 18, 19, 20 year old, like most 18, 19, <laughs> I joined the 20 club. year olds are. Right. Um, so I ended up joining the, the, the U S army. I was a reservist. Um, and I wanted to go through ROTC and, you know, take a commission after graduating from college. But the problem with the army that I found was even though they were paying for me to go through a program in network administration and in IT, and my entire background was in that, I couldn't be guaranteed a commission or an officer role in that field. Like I could have gone into the artillery or into the infantry or into another role because the army kind of places officers based on the army's needs. If you enlist, you can enlist and go into what, what you want. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's just, I kind of, you know, I was getting married, I was finishing college, I was a non-traditional student, I had already worked in the field. And I was like, hey, if I'd spent all this time and my passion and I'm really good at is this, I kind of want to keep going and doing that, even if it's for the military. And since I couldn't, you know, couldn't be guaranteed that, I, I, I dropped out of ROTC, I finished out my, my enlistment um, and, uh, you know, and graduated. And then my wife and I decided to take the first job down in DC. So I ended up going and working for the Department of Defense anyway. And I spent 10 years down there, um, worked on a number of different agencies um, and a number of different programs, did a, a short stint in the intelligence community itself, um, you know, learned so much across all of those. And then, uh, so, you know, kind of did a bunch of work within military health, um, which was very eye-opening, uh, kind of worked on that during the, the swine flu pandemic under, uh, I think it was late, it was it, I guess it was, it was underneath Obama still. It would have so been what Obama's year do you think that term. was? Um, I, we moved down there in 06. I was down there from 06 until 2015. So I, I think that was, Obama's first, yeah, it was Obama's right. first term because Bush right. left in 06 or 04, 06, 06, I think. Anyway, um, so worked in military health during a possible pandemic. I don't know if it's technically a pandemic or just an epidemic, uh, whatever. I think they ever labeled that one as a pandemic. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was swine flu. So there was definitely yeah. genuine concerns. It's a big and deal. Also, yeah. So my job there was, you know, initially as a SAN administrator, which is storage area network. So I had oversight <clears throat> to petabytes of data across different classification levels and uh, very, very interesting, you know, uh, job to help the mil military health figure out, you know, how and where data needed to be appropriately and secured 
Um, and, again, and again, across different classification levels, which is always interesting. Um, it's, you might ask, well, why would you have different classified military, you know, health records? Um, you know, the, the, the example is Matt, you know, here in the US, you're Matt and you go to your doctor as Matt, and you get prescriptions and diagnoses and you have a medical history. But Matt, when you go over to Germany to do work, you are, you know, Yvonne or, 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 or Yuri, or, or you have another name. Maybe you have a cover name. Well, that person needs to go to the doctor too, supposedly. Right. If you need right, medications right. or you break your arm or something like that. How do we make sure that, you know, when, you know, Yuri comes back to the States, he's not prescribed something as Matt that interacts incorrectly oh very interesting when you're across the so you know when you're when you're worrying about things like that or even if you're deployed right and you can't talk about where you were deployed uh because you were in you know in in uniform and you were at a location or whatever you have to worry about that or you were, maybe you were exposed to something in, in an area um you know things like that or you know you have to track somehow and you have to make sure that that data is appropriately accessible by those who need it and not by those who don't so it's a very interesting role to figure out and help shape and make sure that that whole thing worked. So that was, you know, That's my really first kind of real big foray into kind of data security within the military. And for reasons that I before then wouldn't have known that was a thing, right? So it's amazing what you learn in security in this field about why people protect certain things. Um, so- And if you, if you tie that to to, I mean, back then, nobody was talking about it. You were working on things that were um, important in a way where those of you working on it knew it was important. But like, right. you know, now you turn on the news or you look at your phone and look at anything that's going on. It's like it's it's like everybody's talking about it. You had the good fortune of being involved so early on. Right. Your perspective is unique. Like you saw before so. anybody else is even talking about it. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, I, I look. I've always believed I've had a bit of a charmed life when it comes to my profession. I have grown up with and during, and I think anybody that you look at that was kind of born 1975 to 1985, that 10 year span, grew up with the internet, grew up with the emergence of what we know today as technology, and has been watching a lot of what is modern technology around, especially around IT and what is now morphing into security, We've grown up and seen it. Like I grew up and right. you know, with the creation of the CISO as the first, you know, as a role, security teams emerging as a profession um, out of IT. Um, you know, if this was back in the '60s and '70s, we, you know, it the the thing would have been watching the emergence of systems and IT administrators out of telco. Well, this was my time, which was you know, security out of IT, uh, and it's been. I've always kind of felt it's been charmed because I feel like, man, I'm at the right place at the right time. Every time you the world and the technology is changing, I'm like, I'm right there. And I'm, but I'm not just lucky. Um, it's like playing cards. You don't just rely on luck. You put yourself in a position to be lucky. That's, that's how you that's win right. cards. If you read any of the books, um, this has been about paying attention to what's going on um, and, and really keying in on why are there certain risks? How do we think about risk management? What are those risks? What are the ones that we need to pay attention to? And what are the ones that people are just talking about that we don't need to at all? There's a ton of stuff that happens in the InfoSec community that people are just running their mouth about and just crying wolf and worrying about that it's not that big of a deal. And then there's plenty of other things that people are just completely blind to and not talking about and they really should be. Um, I saw this when I was in DOD with Heartbleed, right? Uh, remember, my wife still yeah. points out and still has the newspaper uh, clippings to when I was talking about that issue. Now, I didn't discover that vulnerability. Plenty of other people did. But the potential impact of that to a lot of different groups wasn't fully well known, understood or talked about. And I remember specifically bringing this up, talking to my wife, being like, I think this thing is going to be a real issue based on the usage, where it is, the fact that no one's really tracking where this could be impactful to. And it wasn't, it was, it was like a while until it actually became kind of this, this news piece. Um, so things like that, I think go un, not understood and not well kind of discussed as from a risk management standpoint that really should be. So it's been, 
that's kind of been my thing has been like just kind of paying attention to what's going on and, and keying in on what matters and, and pushing off the things that don't. So those were probably the culmination that rolled into the role at Pentagon that um, I, I really cherished and loved in 2011 uh, through 2015. I was, yeah, I was 31. I got picked up. I got kind of scooped out of my role at, inside of this intelligence community agency. Um, I still remember the, the, the kind of this job fair by the contracting team that won this, this huge contract. Um, it was called CGI. They had uh, former um, uh, AMS guys. Anybody in the Beltway kind of knows the, what happened with that company and how they came to be. But um, I remember walking into the, uh, um, into the job fair and, and 80% of the, you know, the, the work done at Pentagon is by contractors. 15% by civilians and 5% by military, at least the time I was there. Those are the numbers. Around. So very large contracting force, yeah. heavy reliance on, you know, outside professionals and consultants, con, you know, contractors coming in and, and doing the work um, underneath the guidance and, and you know, the, the appropriate leadership and uh, team uh, with civilians and military. So You're I remember a contractor the, reporting to somebody in the military. Uh, yeah, I was actually reporting up through um, a number of GS-15s and SESs, um, regularly briefing them, you know, deputies, uh, different, you know, every under, under You got to tell me what that second. means. Um, so like the, the, the hierarchy within, you know, the, the, the DOD is you got the Secretary of Defense, right? Like you've got yeah. the Secretary of Energy and all the other cabinet positions underneath the president. Underneath the Secretary of Defense, they have a number of deputies. Underneath those deputies, there's a number of different, you know, groups. You know, it's a large kind of pyramid hierarchy of leadership. So my role um, there was as the um, what's known as the IAPM um, as a team lead for the information assurance program management. Information assurance is the military and the DOD's fun word for saying cybersecurity. So before everyone called it cybersecurity, it was called right. infosec, information security. Right, right. And information assurance is the term that we use to qualify you know, doing that. Cybersecurity is the buzzword that the world uses, right? Um, and anybody who knows this, like, remembers, we always called it InfoSec way, way, way before anybody called it cyber. Um, so my role was to, to lead that program management in support of the civilian um, IAPM. I, I worked under two, and they worked underneath the, uh, the SES, who is like the civilian equivalent of a one or two-star general. Um, okay, got it. So kind of think of that hierarchy. And our role right, was okay. to oversee the, over, the, the entire security for the entire Pentagon, the National Capital Region. So SecDef, Office uh, or, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, all the headquarters components for, you know, for, for Navy, Army, Air Force, uh, Coast Guard, everybody, even the White House, all of that rolled up underneath us because we were a single agency. It's now called Joint Base DISA or something else it's changes terms and you know organizations kind of merge and, and yeah. you know efficiencies are, are found and whatnot so it's it's had many different names but um it's a funny story the the reason that and it's technically underneath the u.s army um this is where my history uh my my history buff side comes out um the reason that the u.s army was in charge of the pentagon cybersecurity and physical security was because technically the Pentagon is a U.S. Army reservation. And that dates back to the Civil War when Montgomery from the North defeated um, uh, Lee's Army of the South. And after Montgomery had personally lost, I think it was at least one, but maybe two of his sons to Lee in a, in a, in a battle and buried him, that his sons and his men in Lee's wife's flower garden which is Arlington National Cemetery. Arlington That's National started. Cemetery. Yep. So all of that land wow, was all General Lee's um, land. Um, and it was appropriated by Montgomery after the battle. Um, Pentagon is built on a swamp. Um, so all that land is an extension of that. And they just, you know, built really that whole area out. I, a lot of cities are built on former swamps or, or, or land was made. Look at New York City, look at Boston. Sure, um, sure. DC was the same thing. So, sure. um, so, so that was technically a U.S. Army reservation. It fell to uh, it fell to uh, the U.S. Army to uh, to stand up the agency to be in charge of overarching security. Eventually, 
Um, so yeah, that was how that happened. And then, you know, as the government grew and DOD matured, it fell to a more uh, strategic uh, group called DISA, which is the Defense Information System Agency or something now. So that was kind of my whole DOD days up through 2015. I got scooped up by a Fortune 500 around 2015. Uh, and moved up to Boston to support them as their first vice president CISO, build out their program, and then uh, did that for four years. And in 2019, took the consulting firm Side Channel that you mentioned uh, full time. And you know, we've been taking kind of the lessons learned and the experiences of being uh, full time CISOs with this you know uh, level of experience and expertise, and driving it into small businesses, mid market companies, companies that need the type of advice, need this type of experience, but don't necessarily need full-time CISO, otherwise couldn't get this level of experience. And you know, my focus now solely is not on large enterprises, but on mid-market and, and small businesses and trying to help out that group. So where I'm at. I'm going to tie something together because it's the things that you just were talking about as you progressed through your, your career, whatever it was you, you were a part of or, or information you were exposed to, isn't it, do you find it interesting that, that for so long we had to try and convince small, medium, even large businesses that these threats are real, right? It mm -hmm. was never in the budget. It was always an afterthought. Yet you're seeing, I'm sure, real things happening that, that are, I mean, serious things. And it must be frustrating to be like, well, businesses just don't get it. They just don't listen. And it's been years. It's only really right. happening now because of all the, uh, the cost to businesses and the Bitcoin that they're having to pay, right? And it's well, like it's, 10 it's years right, just, for people to get it. Yeah, it's not just happening. It's not just starting to happen now. Right. You're just starting to hear about it more now. Yeah. Like the news cycles are starting to latch on to these things because they're kind of, you know, ooh, $5 million, you know, $5 million ransom. Like that turns people. The story heads, now. Right, yeah. But the, the reality is, is that these things have been going like, Infiltration into businesses and companies and organizations has been going on since I was a kid. Like, I've been privy to them. Um, you've, seen it's just it. that's, that's, you've seen it for all these years, right? It, it's, it's yeah, nothing new. I've, I've, I've seen it, or I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've helped be part of it, whether it was through legitimate pen testing activities where a company paid, you know, the firms I worked for to break in and show them how that was done. Right. Or right. witnessing or, or, you know, witnessing people actually doing it to other companies. Um, you know, it's, it's not that hard to key in on these things. You know, I used to be part of 2600, you know, and the, the, the Colorado groups and, you know, which is a, a known hacker um, community and magazine. Um, you know, it's, you know, I, I know it's these not people. New. Like, it's I, like, just that people are finding out yeah. about it. I used and to party so, with these guys and, and girls and, and hear and talk to them. And, you know, we ran in the same circles and it was like, I was like, yeah, we just broke into this company. And it's like, look how easy it was. And I was like, yeah, this has been going on for a long time. It's still going on. It's just that still going the on. new cycles right now are, are really going. And the, and the thing about small business that, you know, if I can blow away the whole notion of like, oh, it's not going to happen to me. I'm not a target. Is that you're right. Well, you're right in the half of that. It is going to happen to you, but the reality is you you might not be the target, necessarily the target, but who you work for and who your customer is and who you provide services to, that might actually be the real target. You're just a stepping stone. And that's, that's a fact, right? That's a real um, powerful statement that you just said. It's, it, I hate this example, but is the, it is the most well-known and people still don't quite get it. The reason that target got hacked 10 plus years ago was because the HVAC vendor was breached and they walked them into target systems, period. And how this is it any different? To, we're hearing yeah. all these hacks. You and I deal with it all the time. And it's the smallest, my smallest customers. I love them. They stay mindset. I still have to try, even with everything in the news, I have to still convince them mm -hmm. to do this. Actually, you and I are, are working on something to, um, together right now. Yeah. I got it. And it is, it's for, it's a customer that we share in, in different ways. And they're a small, small organization. They right. do a, they, they, their purpose is unbelievable. Like what they do is just a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're small. And I think if it wasn't for the fact that there was compliance involved and they had to actually do what they're doing, which is they're working with you right now and they're, they're doing, a, you guys are doing a fantastic job of really getting them straightened out. Thanks. Would they really be doing it? I, I say with love of them, no, they wouldn't be doing it. And that's most, and they're in good company. That's, that's the unfortunate right. thing. And I, I tell a lot of small businesses that they're like, oh, well, you know, I have to do this or we're not really where we need to be. And we have this regulation. We're not sure what we have to do. And, you know, and, and the first time, the first thing I tell people and, and potential clients and clients is you are in really good company. Most of your peers aren't doing this either. I'm glad you're at least thinking about it. But the reality is, is, you know, most businesses will not address it unless one of a few things happens. They've had a breach and they're still in business and they don't want to go through that again. So they realize right. they need to do something about it. And the good ones will do more than the minimum. They'll actually take it seriously and realize that their brand reputation, their customer base, their intellectual property, something is in jeopardy and they don't, and they dodged a bullet, right? Or they're able to just completely dig out of it. And, you know, the pain was enough for them to realize they don't want to do that again. And we've had a lot of clients yeah. where we come in, in what I call post, post breach, right? Breach happens, post breach insurance, the incident responders, the janitors come in and clean up. And then they sit there and go, I don't want to do that again. We call side yeah. channel, side channel comes in, helps build a program. The other, the other catalyst is regulation, right? So the reason that you see credit cards systems and transaction processing and all of that in a much better place is because of PCI. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the reason that you see healthcare organizations starting to step up and really address it is because of HIPAA and the adoption of high trust. The reason that you see DOD mm -hmm starting to get its defense industrial base in places because of NIST 800-171 and now CMMC coming out. These regulations are pushing client uh, companies to actually go do the right thing. SOX, right? SOX was the first um, kind of, you know, big kind of impact to financial uh, companies and publicly traded companies that had security requirements built it's in. a while ago. Is it the, yeah. Is it, is it everything? No, great. Right? Compliance is not security but it's a great start, okay? And that's the way that we need to look at it. But that's a big catalyst that forces companies to go do it. So if you're in an unregulated sector, um, look at Colonial Pipeline. You would great think example. that a in critical infrastructure such as that, right? Responsible for who was along the East Coast that got impacted by gas prices because of that, right? We saw it all on the news. Colonial Pipeline and pipeline operators like that are in an unregulated space as far as cybersecurity. But a very adjacent space to them, electrical, is governed and has, uh, you know, uh, standards in place that should be followed called NERC SIP. Why don't pipelines? They're critical infrastructure. DHS has 16 critical infrastructure sectors, and I don't think more than half of them have regulations against them. Finance obviously does. Nobody wants to lose money out of their banks. Healthcare does. Nobody wants to die on the operating table. Electrical does. We, we need power. We wouldn't have this podcast right now if electricity was constantly being shut down. But the other ones, right, where are they at? It's going to be regulation that's going to push those. And everyone first and sisters go, well, I'm not colonial. I'm not Target. I'm not these big guys. No, but they rely on you, small businesses, mid-sized businesses, to be effective. You don't think they do everything, right? Insurance is the same way. Insurance companies rely a lot on small businesses and brokers, right? Finance big banks, right, do certain things, they follow certain certain rules, but credit unions, or, you know, local credit unions, you know, they should be, are they? They're struggling. So it's a push of regulation that's that catalyst. But if you don't have a breach or a regulation on your hands or in front of you, you're probably not really looking at security unless you have a very motivated, very risk, uh, a risk tolerance established at a okay. leadership level inside the organization to actually come forward and say, we need to be doing something about this because I value right. my business, regard of a cat, regard, regardless of a catalyst, I value my business, my brand, my customers that I wanna do the right thing to protect them. I'm gonna do something about cybersecurity. Unless you yeah. have those people at the helm, you're, you know, those companies aren't gonna do it. I see it. And all we can do is spread the word. Like all we can do is try to inform people, educate people, that's why we're doing this. I have a, a client that I've been for years, I've been, I've been trying to get them on the program, right? They do pen tests, but, but they're not doing much of anything else. Great client of mine. Two weeks ago, they had an email breach 
And long story short, we ended up at that point, then they were like, okay, you can react and respond to this. And guess what they're doing now? They're doing MFA. We, we actually found it with somebody from Nigeria that got into their email that was already looking to penetrate and get into everything else and let me, do what they let were going to do you, was it. it. Did you find out where they from Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> so that group, I bet you, I, I bet you 20 bucks. Um, that came out of one of two criminal syndicates that operate out of Lagos. There's two, there's two main groups that operate out of there that do that very same thing. Um, Cause I've seen it. I've seen it at organizations, the same thing. One it's is two brothers. You know it. Yeah. Well, one is two brothers that operate out a bunch of internet cafes yeah. all, all around that area. The other one is actually a well, well organized um, criminal syndicate. Uh, and both of them are making bank. Uh, but yeah, were you able to find like, was it office 365 that was hit? Yep. They came okay, in. So yeah. Did yeah. they, um, yeah. so they came in through Lagos, no MFA. We're able to probably get into the user's mailbox. Did they set up a yes. bunch of rules? Yes. Um, hiding their presence, pushing yes. things into unknown shared folders or other non folders like exactly inbox. What they did. Yep. They set up a couple were, of other rules. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Were they able to then masquerade as, as either that person or the person who they were trying to, and they were using rules to shepherd those messages away. So the actual legitimate user didn't see those messages and the attacker was able to carry out converse, uh, conversation. I bet you anything they were trying exactly to do business what they compromise. They were trying to facilitate a wire transfer or some type of fraud between the person that they attacked and whoever, or they were just using that as a jumping off point to start phishing other organizations because those organizations would be more apt to open it message from somebody that they knew because they were probably in that contact right. list. Yep. We got it really, really early on. <laughs> but thankfully the, the customer said something the second they noticed it. So we changed passwords. But when we did the, um, you know, after the breach happened and we did all the forensics, we saw also that they were in the process of trying to attempt to access other things on their network. I mean, they would yep. have encrypted things and held them hostage. No, they would have pivoted. Those guys are pretty good at business email compromise, and they'll just break into um, email systems, mostly Office 365. Um, you have to check for like the legacy protocols on Office 365 if they're still enabled because they'll still backdoor right. into those. That's right. But um, they're not necessarily known for doing ransomware. Um, and these are called tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs. So certain groups have certain MOs. Like they're really good at certain things and they keep kind of going back to the well on that. They, they, they generally don't veer away and change tactics and they're like, oh, suddenly, you know, we're a business email compromise company. Now we're suddenly going to do ransomware. That would be a major shift for an organization. Think about, you know, like, hey, we're selling lollipops and now suddenly we're going to start selling milk. <laughs> yeah. Kind of the same thing as like you're selling a product or a, or, a, or a tool, but like for you to like retool how you do that and like your distribution, that's a massive shift, right? Like you don't just do that overnight. So you see these groups kind of latching onto something they're good at and kind of going with it. So good. I'm glad to hear you guys. We got it. We got it quick, that. but it's, it's, it's the same story you were saying though. It, even though the, the, the company was open to doing like one thing, they let us do pen testing every year, mm -hmm. the real time monitoring, everything else that we should be putting in place, it's all going to get put in place now. Right. And they were fortunate. And I actually sent them a congratulatory email afterwards because they actually were fortunate Right. And they, they didn't stay, they didn't delay us in doing the, the response we wanted to do. Um, so congratulations to them. But to your point, what a, this is it. This is every, and they're a small business. They have 60 employees. Yeah. And uh, by the way, they do a lot of, I don't want to give away who they are. They do a lot of work for government and they are asked frequently about what they're doing to protect themselves. Yeah. Right. And it's a wishy-washy gray area. So they give the answer, you know, they give answers, but now, they had something happen. And so now right. they're like, oh, 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 we can't have this happen again. Do everything that you've been telling us you want to do. Right. right. Good. And that's, that's what you're saying. That's what happens. And, and uh, you know, I've seen plenty of them where that doesn't happen. There's damage, there's outages, they're down. Um, hopefully they have good backups and running. It's just not worth it. Like it's not worth mm -hmm. it to be reactive or to be, to have to, to remediate. I mean, just be proactive and do everything up front. You saw, you've seen it go from, from, it's you know, from, from early childhood, not yours, but the, the, um, the life cycle of cybersecurity, you've seen mm -hmm. it for decades. And as you said, you pointed out before, now it's just getting a lot of uh, attention, but everybody's got to do something. You got to do something and you got to do as much as you possibly can. Right? That's the message today. The, Don't the, wait. The thing, yeah, you, you really shouldn't 
wait. I mean, there, there's a few things to keep in mind. One, the internet is a bad neighborhood. Okay, you are operating a business yes, in a bad neighborhood. Period. Okay, stop thinking that you are in some safe zone because you're connected to Comcast or whatever service provider, and because you physically are in a good neighborhood where you live and where you're operating. Yeah, where you are connected and what you are doing business on. Look at the look at the internet as a as a bad neighborhood. What would you do physically if your business was in a bad neighborhood? You would take precautions. You, you wouldn't leave the front door way. open. Yeah, you would. You put you you need to think that way. Okay, people need to really think that way. The other thing is people need to stop severely underestimating who the ad, who their adversary is. It's not this. I think we're. I think we finally you know gotten rid of the whole like it's some sixteen year old kid in his mom's basement. Okay, the reality is it's not just who is doing this, it's why they're doing this and what they're doing this for. This is a business to the other side. There is a ROI on it, okay? If I can shotgun approach and spray a set of attacks or, or means across the internet at pennies and turn around and potentially reap millions of dollars because one of those hit, you know I'm gonna do it. It's a shotgun approach, okay? It's total spray and pray. Sometimes it's targeted because you can figure it out, but the ROI is still huge. There is a business on the other side of this and any business owner who is worth their salt should look at that as competition for their own business. How would you treat that? If your competition knew everything about you, what would you do differently? What would you do to keep your competition from knowing everything about you or doing anything to you? You would take precautions, you would do things. Why aren't we doing that with attackers and adversaries? It's because people aren't thinking that way. They're not looking at it as if there is a billion dollar business enough. happening against them for their own company. And this is what I tell clients. It's like, you need to think this way. And the second you think that way, you really start taking your adversary seriously. And then you start actually making changes. But until you don't, you're still sitting in this, this, like, this gray area in la la land of, it's, it's not, not going to happen, happen to me. me. It's not going to be impactful. Right. And then when it does, and you sort of going, oh my God, how did this happen? Why is it so bad? Why can't I just recover and snap my fingers? It's like, because this isn't magic. <laughs> it's actually well thought out and, and planable and, and you can prepare for it. You just chose not to. So don't be shocked with what, ha with, with what comes along when you don't prepare. So. That's right. You, you have, I know you don't have that board in front of you that you talked yeah, sorry. That, but there was a time where, where you drew something that, that I'll, I'll never forget. It was, it was so well um, articulated. And you went from the top and explained how these, a large corporation will have essentially subsidiaries and subsidiary, and they, how they go after companies of different sizes. Do you remember when you explained that? Yeah, yeah. So, you, I mean, you, you know, take the, me through that again. So, I mean, essentially, like, say you've got a large agency like Johnson & Johnson, okay? They're working on pharmaceuticals, okay? You know they have the resources to protect themselves. Now, they're still getting attacked as well, but they have a lot of money and budget to be able to protect themselves appropriately. They take their intellectual property seriously. They're protecting it, okay? But maybe the down, the contractor down or the subcontractor under them that they're relying on for very niche services right? They don't have those types of budgets. They don't have access to those level of resources. So they can't put forward those types of security concerns, but they could be a stepping stone or they could be the target to get, in, get into Johnson & Johnson, right? Just as an example, right? So, you know, if you've got an adversary who wants to get, you know, COVID research or, you know, vaccine, you know, data or research out of Johnson Johnson, I'm not going to target them and waste all my money and resources as an attacker trying to go into the front door. I'm going to target who their suppliers are because chances are they're weaker and they'll let me right. piggyback in. So you need to know where you are in the supply chain and who your customers are. Because if I'm in that supply chain of Johnson & Johnson and my company gets popped, it's going to be known. I'm going to have issues. I'm going to have a supply. I'm now going to become a supply chain concern and blockage to being upstream, they're gonna take notice and they might just go, you know what? Even if you fix it, you're not worth the risk, goodbye. And now you lose, not only, not only are you down and you have an impact, but now you lose a revenue stream. So to anybody who's in the food chain, we're all in the food chain somewhere. 
it's sure. it's not necessarily about your own company and there's nothing there's nothing beyond that it's 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 way bigger than that if you you can be an accountant you can be a law firm um, you can go down the list of everybody that that services anybody you could be a psychologist right mm-hmm. your information is like it's your it's your duty to protect your information because what you it's your duty to protect your clients information even if there isn't any you know, compliance in place or there's no Right. Um, you know, DOL guidelines in place or whatever. Is it not your, it's your duty. Like it's, it's a fiduciary responsibility. It's, it's, it's integrity. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. You have a, I mean, you have a responsibility to your clients. If you're in a service or a profession, right. You'd like you mentioned doctors, lawyers, accountants, anyone who has a book of business um, where they're providing services, you're going to have information on those clients and you need to protect those appropriately. Your clients are expecting that you're protecting their information. That's right. I have I have gone to dentists and doctors when I moved here to uh, to the area first and audited them on their security. I remember one I went to and I was like, I can get onto your your corporate Wi-Fi and your network from the parking lot before I even walked in. Like I shouldn't be able to talk to your EHR system, your electronic health record system, directly from my car in the parking lot because you have open Wi-Fi. I mean, that's a simple thing, but you get so the gist. Simple. Like these are law offices and doctor's offices have notoriously been bad at providing and doing security. I think it has something to do with the profession and their view of how smart they are. And, and that's great. And look, I totally respect that, but you're not that smart. And this isn't, but let field. me add something to that. My experience with, with, with law firms and doctor's offices also is that oftentimes the, the key, you know, the, the principles it's coming out of their pocket in a way, you know, it's their oh, yeah. lifestyle, it's lifestyle businesses. And so to invest in something they don't necessarily um, believe in or, or feel they should be investing in, it's coming out of their pocket. So they're really investing in the things that are going to make them money, which makes sense, but mm-hmm. they're not investing in the things that are going to um, create risk that's going to actually impact them making money. And right, it's like, there's a short money, circuit yeah. there. It's ins- you have to look at it like insurance. And I don't right. mean like buying insurance. I mean like insurance to actually protecting your revenue stream. Like you have to put certain forth certain things. Like right. I don't really want to buy locks on the doors to the office because I don't want to have to spend five, you know, two minutes to unlock it to be able to like, walk in. I just want to be able to freely walk into my office. But I put locks on so other people can't just freely walk into the office. That's right. Like it's the same concept. Um, but yeah, I mean, law offices have been particularly bad because, you know, I've actually heard lawyers tell me this, well, that information is protected under attorney client privilege. <laughs> it might be, <laughs> but the guy who just broke into your file server doesn't really yeah. care about really care about privilege that. because he now has all of those files on his computer. Right. So right. I don't know what to tell you. Doctors offices have been the same thing. I think there's a bit of a professional, uh, I don't, I don't know. I can't ever put my finger on it, but a lot of doctors and principals at doctor's offices I've talked to, you know, before, you know, HIPAA really came in with their security rules and the protections that need to be put in, there was a lot of like, well, we don't really have to do that. You know, it's like, right. I don't know, man, I kind of want my test results, not in the hands of somebody, not me or you as my, <laughs> as my provider. Um, but the reality is that that happens. Um, we did a, um, we, we had a security researcher, uh, uh, a moment a number of years ago where we inadvertently found uh, just on the open internet, an open uh, network attached storage device from a private hospital. Um, and that, that held, you know, all the images of x-rays, you know, HIV test results, diagnoses, even the phone calls between the provider and the client. And it was like, this is freely accessible on the internet. Like and no they didn't username, know. password, yeah, not at all. We put together a whole report, sent it over to them. It wasn't even like, hey, contact us if you need help. It was more of just like, we just saw this. You need to go do something about it. Here you go. Um, and just kind of left it at that. They, they, they closed it. But I mean, this stuff happens more than, than you know. It happens a lot. It really does. I have a few questions. I, I don't want to run out of time and not, and not get to some of no. these questions. Yeah. Um, you've had, I mean, journey has been pretty cool. I mean, the story you told is cool. It's, it's, um, the timing was, was worked out for you. I'm with you. I don't believe in luck, you know, there's opportunity and preparedness and you jumped right. on opportunities and you're a brilliant guy. And clearly your family has, uh, has done some cool things. 
what would you say to somebody? So now cybersecurity is, is like a field and there's people that are going to school for it. And, yep. you know, you, you learned, you came up the hard way, like you did it. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody right now who might be listening, who might want to get into the field? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely started out learning it myself because I was naturally good at it and I actually liked it. And those are two very important things. I think for anyone to do any job, you need to be good at something and you need to, or at the very least, you need to like what you're doing. Otherwise you're just going to be unhappy in what you do. Sure. Um, the, the other piece was, you know, I did end up going to college. I did learn quite a bit getting my bachelor's in that I'm now on the board at my college supporting them and, and everything. So, you know, the programs that are coming out right now and the associates, the bachelor's pro, uh, programs around cyber are amazing. And, and even network technology, I mean, cybersecurity itself is, is really, to me, it's a bit of a myth. Uh, it's not a, it, it's cybersecurity is really just good engineering and architecture period. If you did those things well, cyber wouldn't really be a need. Um, Interesting. we get a lot of heat for that, but, um, my view is if you do those two, first two things, well, everything else kind of comes along with you. So getting a solid understanding in, in, in those things. And if that's through school or through a work, you know, Hey, go after that. Um, I also now teach. Uh, the master's course in incident response at Boston College. So no one's going to do really good en uh, engineering and architecture and you're going to need incident response. So um, it's, this has been a fun course. This will be my second year teaching uh, this course uh, there. So I actually get to be a professor. I got to actually scratch that itch anyway. Oh, um, very cool. But uh, yeah, so I do a lot of stuff and that's, that's definitely one of them. But, you know, going through those programs, you know, learning, learning everything you can, um, and then just getting, you know, getting that opportunity, getting, uh, getting into the field. And, and it doesn't necessarily need to be, hey, I need to be a cyber, I need to have cybersecurity in my title. Go work on a help desk. Do you know how much stuff you'll learn working on a help desk about how computers and workstations work and how users act? And that is probably 80% of the battle is what's happening on the endpoint and how are people interoperating with their computers? Why are they making certain decisions? Right. You will learn right. so much from working on a help desk. Plus, you will learn and you will really only be good if you're good at customer service. And a lot of my job, even being a CISO, is understanding the customer, understanding your user base. And now running my own company, it's all about customer service. So go work on a help desk. Go work as a systems administrator. Go work as a network engineer. If you're in one of those roles, go matrix yourself in and volunteer within the cyber team. Go, um, you know, do, extend yourself, volunteer for projects. Um, and I like that. Like stretch that. yourself. You said extend. Yeah, just stretch yourself. Push your limits. Really get into it and like force yourself to learn. That's what it sounds like you're saying. Like be exposed yeah, to new new information. Right. If you're not being given the opportunities, create the opportunities. Um, yeah, awesome. Go to B sides. Go to meetups. You know, get onto uh, Discord and Slack channels with professionals like this. Find yourself a mentor, somebody who's in the field that you know you like and can you know just ask for uh, help. I, I tell people all the time, it's like, you know, reach me on, on uh, DM me on LinkedIn and, you know, I'll mentor you. Like it might just be a phone call, but now you have my contact information. You have a you know question in the future. Go ahead. I've, I've done that for tons of people over the years. People reach out to me on LinkedIn and it's been like, Hey, can I just talk to you for an hour? Yeah, sure. sure. You know, if you're not selling me anything and you want me to help people love to be asked to help them. And I mean, Really, really true. Very true. I like doing that. You know, yeah. I want to give back because I want to see this field. I want to see society succeed. <laughs> I want to see this field do well. And that's not going to happen with just, you know, guys my age and your age just continually doing it. We need to worry about the next generation, the next generation after that of folks going into this. And we've got to help them. We've got to steer them in the right direction. We've got to give back. Um, so you know, go to talks, great. join join professional service groups, ISC squared. If you have your CISSP, or if you want to go for that, or whatever you feel about certifications aside, like those meetups and those groups that get together of people who have those things, they get together and they talk about this stuff. They're great networking opportunities. So I think you know, there's a lot of different ways to get into the field. I think people kind of shortcut, you know, the they're like, oh, I have to go through school and then I have to get that job. It's like, there are so many different ways to go do and get into this. Um, you just really got to want it. You know, you got to make those awesome opportunities. Right. Now I want to have that, I want to take that and cross it. Right. So you told us your story. We, we heard how you got to where you are, but 
I have yet to meet a business owner who, if you put the, put the ego aside and like, you know, all that, and ha have you found, or did you find that there was some fear involved? Like when you were making that transition into doing your own thing, I know that you're a founder. I know you started something up, right? So what would we say to somebody who's maybe at that point in their career, they want to do it, but they're afraid to do it. And that's a real thing. Like it's a fear is a real thing. Like a lot of yeah. good and a lot of bad. And you did it. You, I did it. I pushed through it and we both have success stories, but what do you say to somebody? So like just becoming like an entrepreneur and like starting yeah. your own thing and not yeah. working for somebody else. Yeah. Uh, having done it now, it's look at the smile on your face. All of a sudden you let you lit up. <laughs> well, it's because, because I realized that, you know, in what I was my wife always kind of makes, you know, makes fun of me because I'm like, ah, oh, I should just sell the company and go work for a Fortune 50. And she's like, you don't like to work for anybody else. Yeah, then what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, right. So the reality is, is that it's like you've you've got to you've got to know yourself, right? You got to know what you're passionate about. I not not only do I like breaking things and breaking into things or learning about how to break into things, I really like to build things. Like I just love building stuff. So you know, I've ticked off a lot of stuff. Look, I led a, you know, a, a great program um, for the DOD by the age of 31. I was a vice president and CISO and then chief security officer overseeing physical security for Fortune 500 at 35. What else the hell do I go do next? Seriously. Yeah. Like, start your own business. Fortune 50. It's a new yeah, challenge. It's like, hey, you let did. me go start my own. Yeah, let me go run but this you had thing. To be, there had to be some fear in there, right? We all oh, have to self doubt. Like, we're human. Me? Yeah, you know? uh, the first the first year, all of 2019 was, uh, you know, me, you know, wondering, man, am I going to be able to sell enough? Because I've never sold. I, yeah. I've been a practitioner my whole life. I've never sold an engineer. Thing until I started this company. Right. It was it. It was right. like, OK, now I need to go get clients and now I need to. Well, how do I do that? I was like, I'm not a sales guy. OK, well, instead of me trying to be a sales guy, let me just be me. And what I found was being Brilliant. authentic and being look. And I lead with people. It's like, I'm not a sales guy. I, this is what I do. This is what I know. I want to come do this for you. I want to bring in people that I know can do this as well as me. I want to bring them in and I want them to go work for you. And that's what I do. And that's how we've been successful. And we've grown, you know, we've grown side channel to over 3 million in uh, annual revenue. Um, and we're, you know, two years into, you know, the, the full-time, you know, existence of the company. You push through yeah. the fear. You have it. You had the self doubt. Yeah. You had that little voice that kind of creeps oh, in the back of your mind. Like, oh shit, but can I do this? But you did it. You pushed through it. And I think that's the lesson because before you said it too. You have to extend yourself. I said the stretch experiences. You just proved to yourself something that you you knew deep down you could do it because you've proven over and over you can do probably anything you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. If you just set your mind to it. And here you did exactly. it again. And now yeah. this is a really really cool part of your um, your journey, right? Yeah, no, it is. It's I, I love this part. And it's because I was I was afraid there was times where I was wondering, man, am I is, you know, are we going to be at a point, you know, where Kim and my family are looking at me like you have to go get a real job like this is what you could always do. You always have that to fall back on. Right. Sure, so it's sure. nice to know that. And you could get a pretty good job, apparently. You, you do. <laughs> yeah. But do I really want to do that? Am I going to do that long enough where it's going to make me happy and then make my family happy? Because if I'm unhappy, they're unhappy, right? If that happens every every hundred percent. You're you know, crossing over to some that. important right. So this is real. So the the fear was, yeah, it was generally like, man, is this going to work out? And what do I need to do? Well, I just I need to I need to stay true to who I am. I need to stay true to the the brand and and what I wanted to create and what I wanted to deliver. And it was bringing people who have actually been a CISO into a niche market of completely underserved companies and organizations who could otherwise never afford someone like me. And right. I just stayed on message with that. And that's who I talked to and I worked my network and I just started putting it out there. And, you know, to date, I haven't made a cold call. $3 million business. I haven't made a single cold call because I haven't had to. I've just talked about what do I do? And that's a part of what I did with CISO life and what you see on LinkedIn and everything else is, it's me yeah. just talking about what I know and what I love. And if you find it interesting and if you think it's valuable, what I'm telling you, you're going to call me or you're going to tell somebody that you that's know right. should call me, calls me. And that's exactly what happens. And, and that's literally all I've been doing. And we've been able to build this because of that. And then it just snowballed to the point where 
I don't do any direct delivery. We've got a team of 25 people, right? 15 of them are, are CISOs. Um, I think maybe that's a lot. Maybe it's like 23. We've got, yeah, I think we're up to like 25. I'm, I'm mean, seeing we, your announcements. You guys are growing. It's I yeah, love watching your announcements. Thanks. And and we're bringing in other people who want to do the same thing, have the same type of you know view. They're at that point in their life where they want to consult. They want to focus on mid-market companies because I'll tell you, any other CISO who's watching this knows if you're working inside of the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500, it takes you quarters, sometimes sometimes a year to get something done. Thank you. you anything know how satisfying done. Possible. it is? With my clients, I see them take action and within a week or within a month, they're doing what we say. I love that. I love that. I you love you know you it. just impacted their life. You know yeah. you impacted their family's life. You know you impacted right. their business family. Like it is a very rewarding thing. And by the way, timing here, you're timing again. It's like this is a great time to be in this business. Um, I'll tell you something real quick. I did one talk um, about two months ago on cybersecurity with uh, a group of, um, it's like a very niche financial group of people. <clears throat> I hadn't even heard of the niche. Somebody reached out to me and said, would you want to talk to our group just about, about mm. what you tell your customers about how to be safe? So I said, sure. Since then, um, it, I, we've done, we have 15 new clients. It's been two months. Wow. And every single one of them are being inspired to do something because the DOL put out regulations that now their industry is saying, you really need to do this. You kind of have to, even though you don't have to. Hmm. It's a, and so you're seeing the same thing. It's a great yeah. time to be in this business, not because of how many clients that we're both getting. It's not about that. What you just said is what it's about. We are helping and impacting people. And it's very fulfilling and very rewarding. I've been in, in the IT business for 20 years. You've been in, in the information security for, um, for a long time. This might be the one of the First times I can recall where I've actually ever felt what you just said. We're actually truly helping and impacting people and we're making sure they're safe. That's, yeah. that's, that's real. That's serious, man. It is a good it time is. to be. And it's just getting started. We have years ahead of us. I know. Yeah. I, I, I love it because I, I'm helping companies who are creating startups, right. Who are creating technology that they are, that they obviously they want to, you know, build something and, and, and make money and revenue, but they're, they're creating a service or a product that society either wants or needs, and we're helping them secure it so that it's available. They can continue and they can continue to grow and they can make it available to others. Or we're helping, you know, companies that have a societal impact or responsibility, or even, or even we're, we're even working with uh, city city governments just to secure what they have so that the people that live there can continue to rely on them. I love that. I, I that's what I want to continue to see. And I really like in the military, there's a big focus on mission. And I think what I took away from that is working with clients who have a, are an inspiring mission, um, a, a good mission, um, Side channel was actually started with a, a single client um, who actually referred me to the client that you and I share. Yeah, and yeah. that client initially um, is the New York Foundling. They started the concept of foster care for the United States. Right. They're responsible for a massive amount of, of, of foster care, right, wrong, or indifferent, the concept and, and, and how it is, and they oversee it. They're a phenomenal nonprofit and charity. We started our company solely to actually help them start doing the, you know, some, some things that they, they had identified as risks. And then we just grew from there, but we did it Absolutely. because Great. the mission was that important. It was like, you need help because of what you do. I want to see you be successful because of what you do, because we need you to be successful. So I get to be kind of choosy with clients. Now we get to do that. Yeah, obviously we're a That's business awesome. and we want to drive revenue, but we want to work with clients who have a good mission, who want to have a positive impact. And then, you know, also, they want to do the right thing. They've made the cognitive decision. They are going to do something about security. You either acknowledge that cybersecurity is a risk or you don't. I'm not going to sit there and sell it to you ever. You either know it or you don't. And then that's why we talk. I, so, I got to tell you something about that, what you just said. That's so um, there's a firm, one of the firms I just mentioned to you that didn't sign up as a client, but they tried, they were, they were trying to listen to what, what happened. The, the owner of the company has a few people around him, a few IT people and, and some other advisors, and they signed up with us. So we go to, to begin the process. We needed to, to gather some information from them. They won't share it. 
right? Hmm. So they're, they're going against what the owner of the company signed on for us to do. They, to this day, not only do they refuse to give us the information we need to do the test, they actually, we believe, they blocked our emails. So we're emailing hmm. the owner of the company. He's saying he's not getting them. We're calling them wow. up. They're, for whatever reason, I mean, to me, it's the biggest red flag. And I, I sent the owner an email letting him know that this is a red flag. Like, I don't even know these people. Nothing yeah. personal, but they don't want us doing these tests. They're, they're trying to, to talk you out of it. I'm like, you're the owner of the company. Yeah. So I don't know if he even got that email from me. I sent it to him in a very, um, I was really appealing to him to find a way to get us what we need so we can do this now more than ever because I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and wow. because I've met them and, and we have some mutual friends now and I, you know, in that industry, I'm like, geez, uh, I'm worried about him. I'm worried about his business. Like, why are they going to such great lengths to block us where we can't even send the guy an email now? Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of bad. So you're, you're talking about having a shared belief system. I'm ready to pull the plug on it because like, it's too much, it's too much resistance. We just want things to flow. Like we want to help you. I don't want to yeah. have to force you to take our help. Um, yeah, I, don't, I want to you, actually you cover one more thing because sure. people watching might be wondering how is it that we work together? We don't do the same thing. Right. And, right. and actually the, the, the firm that we're, we're working on together, um, I do their IT support. We do their day-to-day -day technology. We do the servers. We do the implementation on their cybersecurity. Um, what you're doing is, is really not that. You're doing, and I want you to put it in your own words, what you're doing that's different than what we're doing. Yeah, we, we provide you know, advisory and consulting around you know, cybersecurity needs. So we can do risk assessments and gap analysis on your current posture, figure out where you are today, where do you need to be, build out that roadmap, and we develop a platform called realciso.io that allows us to facilitate that at very, very low cost and built that, you know, internally. And now we make it commercially available. So we, we do this gap analysis because you, you got to figure out, you, you can't just jump in and be like, oh, let's just go implement this, this, and this. It's like, well, why? What's wrong? You have to do it based on prioritization. So right. we do a lot of risk analysis and gap analysis, or risk management and gap analysis on uh, via assessments for, for clients. And then from there, you know, we, we usually stay on, uh, on, a, on a kind of a retainer basis as your virtual CISO. So we take people who are former enterprise CISOs, such as myself, and you can see all the folks that are on our team page on uh, sidechannel.com. And we make them fractionally available into you. We've got clients that you know we're working four hours a month with. We have some clients we're working 80 hours a month with. Just depends on the size and nature and your risk posture. We have clients that are you know, pre, you know, or pre series A through series A, series B, and some even publicly traded companies anywhere between 10 and about, you know, 3000 employees. So we scale really well to these, you know, these groups um, and we support them by enabling and being those advisors around cybersecurity and then working with firms like yours or their internal IT teams to direct them and oversee and guide on the implementation of what we're talking about, what they need to go do. Right. And we're like that right. voice of reason around cyber, but we're meeting with CEOs, CFOs, board members, we're briefing boards, we're briefing executive management. We work with a number of private equity firms and their portfolio companies. So we'll even be briefing you know, the investors or the backers. We get on the phone with our clients, customers or clients to talk about our clients' cybersecurity posture. We'll talk with their auditors, their regulators, we are that CISO as if we were there full time, but we're not there full time. We're there fractionally. You're their, you're their advisor. I mean, you're really at the end of the yeah. day, it's they, they have the belief that they want the advice. They want the guidance. You're doing it. You're doing all of the, those strategic things you just mentioned. And, um, and uh, you know, and then you're, you're hopping at that point where it's like, okay, now have somebody go do A, B, and C, which is where we come in. And that's why it's, yeah. it's kind of cool where you and I are able to, um, to partner together yeah. and I'm, hopefully we're, we're going to do a lot of things together in the future but one of the things i find the coolest about you is is the the depth of knowledge and experience you have i don't know that i'll ever come across anybody that, that that's got the background <laughs> that you got it's true though you you've done uh, so i'm sure much. there's, yeah, there's well, i don't know them i only know you <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'll introduce you to a couple of people that are way smarter than me on this um and are, are very good former you know practitioners you know, now turned, you know, strategic and, and advisors. There's, there's plenty of people out there. Like it's it, a but small thank club you. though, of people that really have that ability to give real good, I mean, experience driven guidance. 
you know. I appreciate the compliment. I, with, Thanks. <laughs> with that, I'm going to wrap this up. All right. Um, I want you to, to share with everybody. I know there's a few things you've told me that you're working on. So to kind of run through it, I'm going to we're going to post it down below in the description. Every place we can reach you. If anybody wants to DM you, talk to me. Yeah. So you can you can honestly uh, Google hashtag CISO life, C-I-S-O-L-I-F-E. You will find anything about uh, what we're doing from that outreach and that training. And it's a it's a great little YouTube channel that it, we have a lot of fun with. Um, you can find me brianhogley.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. They both go to my LinkedIn. You can you can feel free to connect with me on there. Uh, you can direct message me on that. Uh, if you want mentorship, please direct message me. If you want to sell me something, uh, that's probably not the way to go do it. Um, I get a ton of stuff uh, on there about people trying to sell me things for stuff that doesn't matter. Yeah, no sales. Um, yeah, I'm a services company. Stop trying to sell me stuff that wouldn't work. Um, you still but, have that uh, book you know, coming out? You were working I on do, a, a, yeah, a yeah, I do, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and then the only other thing you can find me, obviously, sidechannel.com is our is our firm. You can find out and contact us through through that. If you don't get a hold of me, you'll get a hold of my operations director, Anna, or one of the other partners in the firm. Um, but yeah, the book. So I was the uh, I'm the the contributing author. Uh, um, uh, Cynthia Brumfield is the primary author on a book on NIST um, and the specifically the cybersecurity framework which was put out by the US government, it's version 1.1. One, one. Um, it's a, it's a well-adopted uh, standard. Um, and we have an academic book coming out, uh, published by Wiley. Uh, very fortunate to have them as a publisher. And that is coming out uh, December of this year. Um, and it's going to, uh, it's an academic book. So it's, it's a college textbook that will be, you know, hopefully in the hands of a lot of different college courses awesome. uh, starting spring 2022. So. It'll be uh, at Boston College, I'm sure. That's where you are. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I hope so. so. We got um, one. <laughs> pre-orders are available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and, and all of that. Excellent. But it's uh, it's like the fundamentals of of uh, uh, NIST CSF. Uh, it's a longer cool. subtitle, but that's the so check that out. Uh, so that was a, that was a great experience. Never wrote a book or helped write a book before. Um, so that was that was wild. Excellent. Um, but I think the world needed it because there's not a book out there right now really on NIST. CSF and, and what it does. So this will be the really the first one. And I'm really excited that it's going to be a, a college level book and textbook to be actually used for, for, it's for teaching. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's exciting. So we'll get I all the information down below and everything great. you just said. Um, and I'll put up by saying this, I want everybody to remember that the show is meant to inspire and it's meant to inform you. Um, it's, it's, it's about helping you reach your potential. That's what we're trying to do today. We gave, we heard some great advice on if you're in this field or want to get into this field, how you can do it and how you can reach your potential. I honestly encourage you to do the work, listen to, to the, the advice you were given today. And most importantly, be very humble and you got to hustle. You got to hustle, right? Hope isn't a strategy. You got to take action. All right. Thank you. Thank you.